last six years. You can see this the drop for this year. Um, I'm going to go just slip to this slide. Just I'll come back to that other slide. But here's a look at what contributions have been coming in. So we're getting 9% in from members, and the employers had been paying 17.4. We're going to start to get 22.4% uh, from employers into this part. You can see the normal cost went up from 22 to 23, about 1%. And that's the, the difference between the 7.55% and the 7% discount. It costs more for accruals of active members. But because we're now increasing our fixed contribution rate to 22.4, look how much is now going towards the unfunded accrued liability. There's almost an additional 4% of money coming in um, of the, compared to last year coming in to help pay down that unfunded accrued liability. Now, is it enough? That's to be determined, but for right now, it's, it's good, and, and projections show it getting better by the, uh, by the time um, over the next few years. But now let's go back and look at where did the losses come in for the year that brought that 21 point, uh, 20 billion to 25 billion. Um, again, I didn't put in this chart the assumption changes because it would have skewed every other line if I put in a $3.77 billion line here to the left of the loss. So I, I, that's an addition to what happened throughout the year. So these are the things that happened to PERS throughout the year. I've already talked about we had an actuarial asset loss uh, a little bit. So that added about $217 million to our unfunded accrued liability. The salary increases that I referred to earlier, again, they came, your people's benefits are based on their salary at retirement, right? And if we give big increases to people's salaries, it does impact their future benefits down the line. So that comes with additional liability. Now, giving payroll increases, again, hurts in the short term as far as liability is concerned, but it really helps the funding in the long term because now we're making 22.4% on $7 billion versus $6.5 billion of payroll. So we're getting more money into the future. So that really helps, that helped bring down that amortization period from 48 years to 32 years. It really helps. So it does hurt in the short term. And this is a one-time hit on liabilities, but it will really be impacted for the better with contributions coming into the future. So that almost added another billion dollars of liability. And again, it's a short, it's a one-time hit uh, due to those salary increases. Then you can see everything else was really small. I, I kind of talked about this in the October meeting is the retirement gain loss is, you're gonna be amazed that we, we, we almost nailed it, it's 26.3 million dollar Gain, and that sounds like a big number, 26.3, but we're talking $63 billion. It's a tiny number. That means that our assumptions are working. They're working, and we didn't make minor major um, changes to those. Disability retirement, mortality gains, we're still seeing those. Um, even here in Mississippi, we're seeing those, um, and, and in other places, uh, more deaths than we currently assume. Uh, withdrawal and new entrants and other, again, small little losses, um, but uh, hopefully the, um, the assumptions that we have in place for those will, will help lower those in the future. <clears throat> so that's the fixed contribution rate. That's the liability. Let's talk about the actually determined contribution. This is something that we set up in 2018 was a separate base or, or you know, uh, methodology where we we kind of have a new base for every year, and we amortize that base over a 25, closed 25 year period. So that's what we're doing here. And if you add up the 3.77 billion for the assumption change, and all of those numbers on the previous slide that went to the most, that added up to the left, you get about $5.3 billion. That's what we're adding to the unfunded accrued liability. We're amortizing that over a 25 year period. So about $346 million additional contribution is needed from an actually determined basis. Okay, when you divide that by estimated payroll, we get about 22.55%. 
Now this slide showed 19.78% is what you're currently getting to help pay down the unfunded. But on, on an actuarial determined basis, I'm saying that we need 22.55% to close, to pay this off over a more reasonable period than 32 years, but more like 25 years based on this table here. So when we add that 22.55% to our employer normal cost, we get the 25.17, which I had on my second slide of the presentation. So again, that's where we're comparing that to the fixed contribution rate of the 22.4% is where we get the 112.4% uh, APEC ratio, which is in the red status. So let's put some of these into graph, our table form. This is our projection results um, of looking, running 30-year valuations into the future um, and looking at the funded ratio into the future and we see uh, that funded ratio is 65.5%. An improvement from where we are now, but still not as what we intend to be um, in our goal of 100%. Um, you can see some of the other metrics there. And everything that I have here on table is gonna be in graphical field as well. I think a graph is, is a, better, a better view of this. So this is again looking at the funded ratio. You can see we kind of hover Again, for the next 20 or so years, potentially, if we stay at 22.4%, at around that 60, 60 percentile funded ratio, and then it kind of peaks up in the last few years to close to 70, 75% over the next, uh, the rest of this period. When we look at the cash flow. Okay, excuse me. Yes, sir. Let's yes, sir. Let's, let's stop right there. <coughs> Go back to the chart. Yeah. Uh, if you will, it's easier for me to read. So, in 2023, we're working our way up to the 22.4? Correct. Okay. And if we leave it at the fixed amount, 22.4, <coughs> and do not go up to the 25 after three years, in 30 years, we will be funded <coughs> all of our other does yes. all that. Yes. We will be at 75% fund. That's correct. And nationwide, it's pretty close to that, what the funds are at, about 80%. Nationwide, the public pensions are funded at about 80%, maybe? They're probably even less than that. Okay, yeah. so it'd be close to what the other funds are. Now, current, our, goal, current average, right. our goal is 100%. I, I know that. And I understand that. And I understand that you as the actuary have to tell us <coughs> you're required for your fiduciary responsibility to say we need to move it up to 27% so that we'll get to the 100%. But our board, because we want to do the fixed return, we can leave it at 22.4 and at the end of three years not go up now please let me tell you i don't know what's going to happen between now three years and three years to the 22 i have no idea but we can choose to go with <coughs> and hopefully in 30 years be at 75 percent so I, I just want everybody to understand that the board is being very responsible by not jumping into automatically uh, approving the uh, actuarial determined contribution rate because we're taking into consideration many other other things and I, and I feel I feel very good about this uh, where we are and what we're doing at this time because i'm just going to tell you we're never going to be at 100 percent i know we're not supposed to say that it'd be wonderful but i don't think we'll do hey after i'm dead and gone we'll never get that in my opinion so i just want to say that i think the board has been very responsible with the fixed rate that we have adopted on here 
and, and we're going in a very positive direction for the system, so to speak. So uh, in three years, we'll have to make another decision. Maybe soon, I don't know, but right now, this looks good to me. But the concern is that he has for 5% now, uh, but in 5, 6, 7 years, what are you going to ask again? Is it continued to be? Uh, well, actually, in three years, we're going to ask for another 5% by the actuary of the term contribution to get it up to 12, uh, 26, yes. and, and maybe actually more than that when we get to that point. So we got five now. We're going to ask for five more in three years. But I'm saying, if we leave it, if we do it, don't add the other five, then in 30 years, we'll be funded at 75%. And I'm comfortable with that. Well, when does it ever stop? Does it ever stop? That's so we're going to get to that question when we ask about liabilities here in just a few minutes. We'll, we'll come back to, to that point, and I'll ask that question later. But I just want to make a comment about where we are and how I feel on the comfort level here. And I guess the other question I have too, and it's nothing you can factor in as of today, and it won't affect your short-term calculation, but it might affect your long-term. Assuming the prospective tier five <coughs> proposal passes, which brings the new hires after a date in with the no approved, no guaranteed COA, that's going to impact your long-term projections at some point. Correct. And, and yes. this could also lower the potential of funding necessary possibly you know, again I, I, I don't know, I, yeah, no way it, to know that it uh, could. remember the the tier five is for the period beyond 30 years right it's not going to fix the solution today right. it could depending on what the FCR is, the fixed contribution rate is, it could deter any further increases in that over the over the over the next few years. It could do it could do that, sure. but really the tier five is not solving the twenty five point five billion dollar issue. It's it's setting PERS up for the next generation of everybody at this table and in this room. Um, for 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 success and, and controlling the cash flow. I understand that your approval won't be as great for those new hires right. from that point. Forward. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <coughs> that normal cost that we showed is going to be less, and it's going to come down. So we'll have more money to put towards the underfunded accrued liability. And you mentioned in there that it could deter deter the future growth of the fixed contribution rate. Right? Okay. And then. <coughs> Let me ask you this, if you would, in the context of what they were talking about. Could you comment just a little bit on a couple of lines down? It shows the heyday, the actuarial yeah. contribution growing to 30, 40, 40. Yeah, I was going to do that on a graph, but yeah, I can show the numbers if, if more folks like the numbers. Um, I thought more people would like the graphs. But, um, yeah, so this is, again, staying at the 22.4. But when we calculate that ADEC, that actually determined contribution rate every year, we're at 25 now, and that's going, then we've still got a couple of years of asset losses. That number is going to grow. And if you're only contributing 22, but your actuary tells you to contribute 27, you're shortening that, um, that paying off that unfunded. You're not paying it off entirely. So that ADEC is just going to grow because we're going to have a contribution shortfall. So that A deck is anticipated to grow over 40% if the 22.4% continues as is. Does that answer your question? Again, I'll show you the graph form which, uh, both of those. Which yes. means if the board chooses not to go with the A deck, mm -hmm. then we gotta be comfortable leaving that right. marker red yes. for a while. That's because right. it'll turn back green later but it will grow and it will stay red for a number of years and it will turn back green as you approach 2053 right. so it, the, that's what i'm saying the board just has to be comfortable in its own skin to know what the numbers are saying and red does not mean it has to change it means you look at the numbers and 
anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And this is this is it, those numbers in graph. So this is the eight day growing to 40, 45 percent over the next few years. So again, this is kind of just a, a summary slide of where we were um, at the beginning um, of my initial remarks. But where we are, as far as the metrics that are in the funding policy, is, is yellow, yellow, red. Um, so this means that, that we, as the actuary, should recommend an increase to the board. And so we are. So we're recommending that the board consider increasing the current FCR by 2% of annual compensation each year um, and for five consecutive fiscal years until the FCR reaches 27.4% of annual compensation. And if it does that, this is where the metrics will fall. Um, again, using the 7% discount rate, everything assumed to go as planned, the plan would be at 98.5% in 2047, and the ADEC ratio would fall below 100% uh, immediately if we valued the FCR of 27.4%. Again, it's still phased in. Uh, through the cash flow, but just using that metric, we would get to human status. Here's a look at the funded ratio line. If again, if going to 20, phasing into 27.4 percent, where we'd be um, again 90 percent in 2047, but well over 100 percent funded in just a few more years thereafter. And then here's a look at that ADEC to FCR ratio line, and you can see now if the FCR goes up to 27.4%. Now we don't have as many as much contribution shortfall. The ADEC is still above 27.4. Dr. McCoy pointed that out. Is it is still 30 to 35% between there, but it's 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 that ratio is is much much tighter uh, than if, if the board stays at the 22.4. Any questions on hers before I go into the other three plants. And I'll, I'll go through this a little faster. Do you happen to have a slide that, that puts the mortality table of the physical of, of, of baby boomer and their mortality as to how it would fall on this 30-year uh, projection? You know, I mean, it, to, to me, it almost looks as if the mortality table mimics the funded ratio. I mean, it's just, you know, as they... This, this graph more, I think, more illustrates the baby boomer generation and, and then dying off and, and getting off of the retired, retired payroll for PERS is this is the cash flow. So this is the benefit payments uh, minus the contributions coming in. And you can see as a ratio, we get to a point around 2036 or so where we have the worst cash flow uh, expected, meaning more benefit payments are going out versus contributions coming in. But then it does start to get better because we're anticipating less retirees from PERS in the future. And that's because of the generational uh, of, of folks not staying in in, work, uh, in one place for their career, like the baby boomer generation did, right? Uh, we're just seeing less retirements every year. A couple of years ago, we had 4,000 retirements in one given year. Now we're seeing 3,200, 3,000 retirements in a year. We're not seeing as many because the, you know the population isn't retirement from PERS. Um, so again, I think this graph shows that that point of baby boomer mortality is going to happen around the mid 2030s. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, before you leave, her, let's go ahead and answer that question. And Bill alluded to that. The board voted uh, to do a legislative package about the uh, tier five. And there would be no guaranteed COLA there. So on the tier five, no COLA, it is the 3% and the 3% compounded that that liability does not, is not there for approving. Is that correct? 
And that starts with the employee that we said would be start being hired in July of 2025. I think it's said 2025. Okay. So, so that's where that will begin to have an impact. What other uh, liabilities will be there other than what the uh, formula for uh, how much you get, how much the retiree gets? You know, our, our formula is you get so much per year and then in 25 years it's so much and that is the actual liability that is being approved. Yeah. I, you asked me this question this morning and um, I, I can get you with an, an amount, a dollar amount. I don't have it you know, with me now. Um, but just think of it this way. If normal cost, okay, total normal cost is the cost of accruals for active members, right? And for tier four people, or one, two, three, four, we're setting aside money, we're paying money into the trust fund now while they're an active members to pay their benefits and COLAs into the future. If we bring in a tier five that doesn't have a COLA, right, what does that do for our normal cost? It brings it down for those new tier five people. So that, and, I, and we, Devet and I go back and forth, we've calculated that 3% COLA costs, and it's just coincidence, it costs about 3% of normal cost. So if normal cost is the combination of the nine and the 2.6, or almost 12%, the total normal cost is going to come down for tier five to about 9%. And that's what we kind of showed in those slides when we were talking about tier five over the summer, right? So we've saved now 3% on normal cost accruals. Now we're gonna give some of that savings to the members. They're gonna pay less, potentially, the legislation still gotta go through, but potentially they'll pay less 2% and the employers will pay less 1%. So that 1% is what the employers are gonna save on tier five. Now again, we get 16,000 new active members every year. You think about do the math, in 10 years, or a good 10 years, you've almost um, flipped your population. So it's gonna be tier five. So it's gonna take a while, and those active members' liabilities aren't as much as retirees, but that 1% will help. Again, I can get you a dollar amount if you'd like, but that's perception-wise, that's what tier five would do for her. So when we get to 2026, <coughs> this chart will have the member rate, and we'll have 9% for some, and 7% for some, and the normal cost will be different for the two groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the employer rate uh, will be, it, it, how, how, is that, how is that going to be impacted at that point? That, because the yeah. employer is still going to have to be paid on the liability. Right, right, right. So the the nine percent, if we blend everybody together, which we currently do now, we blend everybody together and come up with one normal cost rate. If we continue that process, um, yeah, the member rate will start coming down to seven percent or whatever it's passed in legislation and the total normal cost rate of the employer's normal cost will start coming down as well. So if, this, if the total stays at 22.4, or our recommendation 27.4, again, that's even more money to go down to pay off the unfunded accrued liability in the future. Again, it will take time, but it will eventually help um, <coughs> curves in the next 20 to 30 years. 40, 50 years. Did that answer your question? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. great. All right, let's move on to everything. Everybody do the PERS. All right, we're, we're going to get through some sensitivity stuff. I know this is a long presentation. I really appreciate it. We've got 20 minutes to lunch. Uh, um, we'll get make sure we're done before then. A higher patrol, again, same return, 7.5%. They added about $43 million of liability due to the assumption changes. 
Um, their fixed contribution rate is 49.08%, and that will pay off their unfunded now in 30.6 years. So they had a significant increase um, in that amortization period. Um, their projections show their funded ratio um, getting to about 78.6% funded in 2047. So again, th this is a big deal for this plan as well, these, these uh, assumption changes. This is a look at their liabilities of $742 million, again, pales in comparison to the size of PERS, this plan, but still very significant. They've got a little bit more assets to cover uh, this, so their unfunded is only about $227.3 million. Here's a look at their plan, uh, Highway Safety Patrol plans, gains or losses. This plan has always historically been more volatile in the assumptions. We bring in a new class, we have retirements, you know, we have pay, the pay rate increases. We won't see retirements for four years until that kicks into their final average earnings, right? So it really depends, economic reasons. There's a lot of things that go into this plan uh, that cause behavior to flip-flop either way. Uh, we did see gains for salary increases. They got their salary increases last year, so we saw a big salary loss last year, but this year they didn't get um, salary increases because they got it last year. Uh, retirements that is actually a big mortality gain uh, for this plan. So a lot more retirees uh, deaths than we had uh, currently assumed. Uh, the uh, the other I'll just point it out because it is kind of the largest number here, um, and we we dug into that. We we'd like to say it's kind of the the end all whatever else is left goes into the other bucket. Um, but most of the changes here this year are data changes. Um, you know, and a lot of times folks will be hired and there were two new classes of, of uh, troopers in this year, this fiscal year, one in August of 2022 and one right before June 30th. So we had two new classes and, um, and, then, and then it was one the previous year. But a lot of times we don't get the data of how much military service they have when it comes in at first and we get that later on. So if they come in and they have four years of military service, that's given free to them as part of their benefit. So that kind of does increase liabilities going forward. So that kind of catches all into the other bucket. Uh, here's a look at the funded ratio uh, slide. Again, uh, we're down to 65.4, but they've been hovering pretty much right around that over the last few years. Um, we are not recommending an increase in their contribution, fixed contribution rate of 49.08%. Um, they've been pretty pretty good with their funding um, pers perspective or projections looking wise. Um, but again, their normal costs went way up. So from 16.06% of pay to 19.36%. So there's an additional 3% less to go towards the unfunded accrued level. That's why we saw that big jump in the amortization period, because it's taking a lot. Uh, that 3% or more is, is a big deal in paying that off. For this year, this is new for both Highway Patrol and, and this legislative plan, is we came up with an actually determined contribution like PERS. It's the first year we're doing it. Uh, it's kind of been in there, but kind of just as a metric, um, a third year metric. But now we've set aside, a, a set up a new funding policy of a closed 25 year period similar to PERS. So that actually determined contribution payment of the unfunded actually we're thinking will cost 32% of pay. They're getting 29.72% of pay. So that's the difference between the 25 year period and the 30 year period is that, that difference there. So their ADEC uh, comes out to 51.62%. So that is actually currently more than their 49.08% that they're getting in so that's why we've gone to a yellow status for them. So again, yellow status means, and here's the projections of, of those numbers, but funded ratio is you know, it's pretty level for the first few years, but we do see a, a little bit of a slight trend increase into uh, this plan as well uh, for the funded ratio. But they're in yellow status for all three of their metrics, so we're gonna kind of um, stay status quo, if you will, for now, but recommend your, or just note that with any negative experience or potential with 
even without negative experience, with expected experience, we could be approaching that red status um, and be asking for more than the 49.08%. But we're meeting with them tomorrow, uh, the administrative board tomorrow, to, to share those results uh, with them as well. We took out the people slide? No. Um, it's in the appendix. Um, there's a lot of material here, so we didn't want to go through everything. It's, it's almost 100 slides. But they do have 507 active members. Um, again, if they had two classes this year. Um, I think the first class was around 60 and, or 50. And the, the second one was around 20. Um, I know I read that in the paper, that their second class wasn't as much. But they're up over 500. All right. All right. Supplemental legislative plan. Okay. Um, Again, yeah, they returned 7.5 percent as well on a market value basis, 7.1 on an actuarial value basis. Their funded ratio did go down as well, uh, from 79.6 to 75.2. Assumption change is at about 1.6 million dollars. That's M, a million with an N. Uh, so not, again, not a big liability uh, plan comparatively to hers. Uh, amortization periods pretty much almost stayed level 21.9 last year, 26.5 this year. This plan, we actually did increase it starting July 1st to 8.4. We were have been at 7.4 for years as their contribution rate. We're increasing that to 8.4 as of uh, this year, uh, this fiscal year starting, so that, that did help some, um, it helped offset some of uh, the increase uh, uh, due to the assumption change. And their projected funded ratio is 78.4%. Liability, they have about $31 million in liability, so you know, when you add $1.6 million due to assumption changes, it's it's kind of got the same impact, if you will, that PERS, that has on PERS with 3.7 billion. Um, here's a look at their unfunded in the green, it's just over $7 million now. Um, their experience, you know, again, they had payroll, the payroll increases, or salary increases this year, comparative to what we assume. And again, that's a lot of the times it's, it's brought on by how long the session is, right? Um, if it's a longer session, they're making you know more money in, in years, uh, but we've seen the last few years have really brought on uh, extra days to the legislative session, so higher increases, uh, higher pay. Uh, we've seen across the board, but other than that, most of the demographic changes were were gains. Uh, this plan, mortality, service returns, withdrawals, everything else was a, a pretty much a gain. Uh, their funded ratio slide. Look at where they were. They were at eighty percent a few years ago, now down to 75.2. As far as their contributions, their impact, again, is, is relatively smaller comparatively to, than to PERS, uh, but their normal cost did go up to 3.21%. So, uh, but again, that 8.4% is, is bringing in more money to help pay down that unfunded accrued liability. Here's a look at the A deck for them as well. So I, we're saying over a 25 year period to pay off that $7 million unfunded would cost about 463,000 a year, or as a percentage of payroll, about 5.36%. In comparison, we're getting 5.19%. So not too far off of where we're at there. So we're not a bank for all of their benefits. Sorry? They're virtually paying for all of their benefits. The current was paying for all their uh, one, two, one versus the three. No, I'm sorry. That's the employer's normal cost. So it's about a even split. Yeah, it's, the total normal cost is about six percent. So it's about an even split. Uh, when we look at their ADEC uh, ratio, again, 102 percent. ADEC came out to 8.57. So when we divide that by 8.4, we get a little bit of a low percent. So again, they're in the the yellow category as well uh, when we look at that funded ratio and other metrics. So we we feel like, again, caution, 
experience could bring out another increase in the contribution rate, but we're, we're, we're happy right now at the 8.4 percent of even there. Um, how are we doing? I think okay. 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 I just want to go through the the risk um, portion of this, and there's only about six more slides, so bear with me. Um, but this is important to kind of look at, and I know we've looked at it in the past, and and I wish more plans would would look at it. I appreciate you guys wanting this as part of your valuation report every year. But this really looks at the short-term and long-term risks of, of PERS and the other pension plans as well. So, and, and, and this really brings apart, there shouldn't be any surprises, um, hopefully for you all when we come here next year and give you results. But um, this is investment risk. So investment risk is probably the biggest risk that a pension plan can take. Um, obviously, you're investing in equities and fixed income and uh, market all over the place. There's a lot of risk that you take as part of investing. So there's a lot of volatility and standard deviation when we come up with returns. And this year's return was right around expected, so that's why I said it's kind of odd. We don't see that very often. We usually see some swings in, in returns. So here's a look at what would PERS and the other two plans look like in for single year events. The first part of this is what if you got a 1%? What if you got a 13% return in 2024 fiscal year? You can see the relative impact of that projected funded ratio in 2047 for each of these plans. So we got a 13% return. I know I wasn't here yesterday for the return, but I, I, hopefully we're up for the year uh, after the last month and a half of returns. Uh, but again, 13% return would increase our projected funded ratio by a little over 10%. That's great. You know, just in one year's investment, it's really powerful, the time value of money of getting that additional investment earnings and be able to invest that over the next 23 or so years. Um, however, it goes the other way. If we get a negative 15% return, you can see that the plan, the projected plan, would be in dire need of, of additional funds as the fund ratios would be in the 20s and 30s range. Uh, we do also do kind of a stochastic modeling of six, seven, and eight percent returns, just to show you. Um, so we vary the rates. It's not just a one time one percent or seven percent. It's varied, but it averages about seven percent or six percent over the next ten years. And you can see uh, where those projected funding ratios line up. We also have demographic risk. There's a risk, and we've been dealing with this for the last fifteen or so years, of membership growth or decline. So there's a, there's a risk for that as well. So we'd like to give you guys an idea of if we have you know, a decline in population of 0.5% each year for PERS, and that would bring PERS population, active population, to about 120,000 active members from the current 145,000 members. So not out of the question if, you know, possibly, but um, hopefully not, but maybe, um, but you can see the impact of that would really worsen. And you'd think like, we have less people, less benefits to pay out. But again, it goes back to that funding. And now we're getting less payroll, less money coming into the trust fund. It hurts. It's worse. It, it kind of has that opposite impact uh, of, of not getting membership in. And that's what we've seen over the last 15 years or so. And that's part of you know, the predicament we're in now is, is the lack of membership that we've had over the last 15 years. <coughs> we also look at assumption risk. Assumptions based on our 7% discount rate or our inflation assumption or our wage inflation assumption. You can see the numbers there. Again, not a big impact comparatively to other things, but again, just to be aware if we were to uh, decrease our discount rate again to 6.75, I'm not saying. Um, I'm not recommending that, but if we were to do that, you can see uh, where the fund projected funded ratios would go. And then lastly, the contribution risk of putting more money in, a 1% more, um, into either of these three plans, or 1% less into either of these plans. <coughs> For PERS, it has about a 5%, about a 5% rule. 
1% more, if this was to go up to 23.4%, you get about a 5% increase in your projected fund duration. So, uh, oh, I almost forgot. Got yeah, one more slide. Uh, Mississippi Municipal, the, the lost plan. Uh, the plan that was closed in the 80s, uh, was just has retirees left in it. There's 1,391 retirees still collecting benefits from those plans over, over 17 different municipalities across uh, the state. Um, we do uh, a report, we'll be meeting with uh, those representatives tomorrow uh, as well as the Highway Safety Control Board. Um, um, for the most part, it, pretty good news for them, even though they, they, we lowered their discount rates um, as well, the investment return assumption. Um, Tupelo did grant a 3% ad hoc benefit increase for most retirees. Um, they've been doing that pretty consistently over the past few years. Um, but the assessed property values are up uh, for these municipalities. Uh, 14, or, yeah, 14 municipalities have their assessed properties go up, only, de only three decrease. So that's really good for the state. And those millage rates are based on the assessed property values. So that's the contributions coming in to help fund these proposed plans. So only four uh, of the municipalities need to increase their millage rates So out of the 17. So that's good news. I think last year, I think it was flipped. It was like 13 had to increase and only four did because we had such a bad investment year. And they're more volatile than investments. So, um, but just to keep you aware, we're, we're meeting with those folks tomorrow. So, and again, now, I have done. The rest of the information can be found in your appendix and or your reports. Any further questions? Any further questions? Board. Yeah. Nothing, nothing more. Do we, uh, I mean, the motion to do is the report the, 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 the we and received the report. The act, this is this is a combination of the evaluation and projection, right? Okay. Those two, we have a motion. Second. Second. We have a second. Any further 